I have the privilege of introducing someone who walks the walk as well as is a model for audacious action. A true progressive, Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum has transformed the city of Tallahassee into a world-class place to live, work, and raise a family. Tallahassee has Florida's fastest growing economy per capita, and thanks to investments in the sharing economy, a new 120-acre solar farm and livable wages for city employees. We can clap for that. But this brother didn't stop there. He's beaten the gun lobby twice in court to protect common sense gun laws and welcomed, and welcomed refugees, immigrants, and the LGBTQ community to Tallahassee. He lives in Tallahassee with his beautiful wife, RJ, and their three children. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Andrew Gillum. I've turned the three into tree. I was about to say, what is that? Thank you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Man, brother, you are coming on the road with me. You just, you have no idea. We are traveling together. Good evening, everybody. Audacious. All right, it works. Uh, if we want to pass the microphone around a little bit. Uh, it is a real treat to uh, join you here this evening. My name is Andrew Gillum. I have the pleasure of serving as the mayor of Florida's capital city, Tallahassee, Florida. And I have to admit that when uh, we got outreach from my good friend Michael uh, to come and join you at this event, I couldn't form in my mind why Michael would have me come and speak to this group of experts upon an issue of which I am, of course, concerned, and of course, as a public policy maker, get to lean into. Uh, but I wondered, uh, in San Francisco, where everybody pretty much has a PhD, even if they don't, uh, <laughs> what I might be able to offer by way of perspective that might illuminate this fine evening. Uh, my first thought was, well, we went through the Rockwood Leadership Academy together, uh, where, uh, in front of a bunch of strangers for about a year and a half, we took the elevator to the bottom, below the level, got to know each other very intimately, and I figured maybe he had something on me, and I wouldn't be afforded the chance to say no. Or maybe he had thought that over those, uh, that, those set of uh, many months that I had said something profound or inspirational, and then I thought maybe not that maybe Michael realizes that I uh, am from Florida, born and raised, and maybe he recognized that the governor of my great state of Florida, Rick Scott, uh, says he's not a scientist and therefore can't say whether or not global warming is real. All right? Now, we didn't need to be reminded that he wasn't a scientist. We all knew that. And so then I thought, well, maybe it's because he knows I do believe in science, right? I, yes, it's an amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing that's an applause line, like. Where, where do they do that, right? I mean, science is a thing. And then maybe it was that he saw that as mayor of the city of Tallahassee that the same week that Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord I was proud as mayor to break ground on a 120-acre solar farm, tripling the amount of solar energy that we produce in our city. But whatever the reasons, whatever the reasons, uh, my final reason, by the way, was maybe he realizes that I'm a dad to three kids and I needed a vacation, but <laughs> it's my wife who really needs the vacation from the four of us, that's for sure. But whatever those reasons, uh, I'm here to assuage your concerns and let you know that I have no monopoly on the right answers. But I'm very, very pleased to share uh, at least a little bit of what my experience has been with maybe some audacious actions. Um, I want you to know, uh, having grown up in a working class uh, neighborhood in South Miami, um, often exposed to our own set of environmental challenges that 
we just kind of had to accept in many cases because we didn't know much better um, that an organization like this um, exists to protect people like me and in the neighborhood that I grew up in um, where folks may or may not have been exposed to, to more or may not have felt empowered to do anything about it, uh, that the work of the Center for Environmental Health exists for many of us. And so for that, I am thankful. I want you to know that, that's right, you all should give CEH a hand for that. I'm here tonight because the Center for Environmental Health, CEH, has planted their feet firmly in the gap on behalf of children and families. And that from our very, the very humble beginnings of this organization where Michael Green uh, was using his background as a staffer with the US Department of Energy in his personal credit card. You must have quite a limit. <laughs> CEH has fought life-saving battles to keep lead out of children's products, stood shoulder to shoulder with communities of color in the fight for environmental justice and shut down California's last medical waste disposal incendiary, right? Incinerator. The odds were long in many of these battles, uh, and I know a little bit about those battles, but the odds were long. Uh, but thanks to the great work of the staff, of the board, of your amazing leader, uh, we're here today, tonight, celebrating some amazing achievements uh, due to some audacious actions. And frankly, that is the core of audacious actions, just like your struggle against Pepsi and Coke. All right? CEH's bold, ambitious, and most importantly successful fight with these two corporate giants to eliminate a cancer-causing chemical, chemical in their products is a monumental victory on behalf of consumers, children, families, for generations to come, not just today, but well into the future. It's a victory that says, under the Safe Drinking Water Act and Toxic Environmental Act, California's chemical right to no law, no corporation, no matter how well known or how brand friendly they may be, are immune against audacious actions. Congratulations on the work that you all have been doing. I salute your extraordinary work. And I'll have to say that while I didn't take any actions against Coke and Pepsi, uh, I'm pleased to share my own audacious actions as we took on the fight against the gun lobby in the, in the NRA, right? And I mentioned that fight because there's so much about these fights that are very common, usually on the other side of very, very powerful, well-moneyed and well-heeled interests. And oftentimes on the opposite side of those fights are people who are not always aware of what their power and what their influence can be to create the kind of change that we all want to see. In my particular fight, in the state of Florida, the home of the Pulse nightclub massacre, the Fort Lauderdale airport shooting, most recently the massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, and the everyday gun violence that pervades our city streets in and out of every single community across my state. In the state of Florida, I was allowed to be sued and drugged through court for two years, all because we refused to repeal a single ordinance in our city which simply said, you cannot shoot guns in city parks. Radical. No, no, no. It is as uncourageous a public policy statement as anything I have ever heard, right? You cannot shoot guns in parks where our kids play and our families picnic. And in the gunshine state, as we're sometimes known, <laughs> an elected official can be personally sued, personally fined up to $5,000, personally responsible for reimbursing the attorney's fees of the opposing party up to $100,000, cannot be represented by your legal counsel but have to find your own representation, and ultimately can be removed from office at the discretion of the governor. That is still the law in the state of Florida. Uh, his is right. Uh, in Florida, I tell you some other things you could do, but a hiss will be fine for tonight, right? We faced uh, an uphill battle, but we were able to beat them at the circuit court. We beat them at the appellate court, and I wanted to take it to the Supreme Court 
if they wanted to continue this fight. And today we have over 20 cities that are now bringing a joint action lawsuit where we're asking the court, the Supreme Court of the state of Florida, to declare this law unconstitutional, right? I want you to follow us in this fight. Audacious actions, right? Audacious actions. And I got to tell you, for me, much of this began real early. You see, I'm from Miami-Dade, Florida. I grew up in a neighborhood called Richmond Heights. Born to my mother, Frances, who was a school bus driver, and my daddy, Charles, who was a construction worker when there was construction work to be done. And when there was no construction work to be done, you might find my daddy on a street corner selling fruits or vegetables or on Saturday morning across from the cemetery selling flowers to bereaved families. My mother and father did everything that they could to make a way for me and my seven, six siblings. I'm, the fir I'm number five of seven, the first in my family to graduate from high school and the first to go on to college. We know what it means. We know what it means in our family to see intergenerational poverty interrupted at the hands of a good public education thanks to the audacious actions of my mama and my daddy, right? <laughs> but because my parents would have to get up so early in the morning, they would load us all into one car. Don't blame us, I don't know if we had car seats. <laughs> I don't know how you do that with seven kids. They would drive us over to my grandmother's house where we would sleep a little bit longer before she would get us up and get us ready for the day. And my grandmother had two routines that she would perform. One, she would take her bottle of olive oil and dip a finger of olive oil and build a cross on my forehead. It was her way of sending us out into the day with a blessing that no harm would come our way. And then she would have this regular saying. She'd say, boy, go to school. Mind your teachers. Get your lesson and one day bring that education home. She said, bring it home for your mother and your father who get up every day to get out there and slave on somebody else's job in order to keep a roof over your head and clothes on your back and food on the table, bring it home. She said, bring it home for your little brother and your little sister who don't know what it is yet, uh, bring it home. She said, bring it home for that little boy down the street that you play with and God knows where he gonna end up, bring it home. Now, I didn't all the way know then what my grandmother was trying to impart on me, but I would come to learn that what she was saying was it, it wasn't just about me. It was about my little brother and my little sister. It was about my mother and father. It was about the boy down the street who she didn't even like. <laughs> right? There was this belief that if I did good in life, we would all do good. Right? That if I went far in life, we would all go far. And quite frankly, um, that's kind of the story of this work, that you all are standing in the gap on behalf of people who sometimes don't even know that you exist, but you're doing the work anyway. Some of you all may be familiar with the story of the Maasai tribe, an East African community that was known over the course of history for demonstrating excellence in all things, excellent hunters and gatherers, e excellent uh, family men and women excellent warriors, and they had a common greeting that they would share between each other. Whether it was a man encountering another man or a woman encountering a family, it was very simple yet profound. And the question that they exchanged between each other was, and how are the children? And how are the children? And how are the children? Because they are a people who recognize that how well society is doing would be measure how well the children are doing. And so my question for the work that we are all doing is that all of us want to one day, if asked the question, be able to answer unapologetically that the children are well. The children are well because we've taken lead out of water. The children are well because we've taken dangerous contaminants out of toys. The children are well because we have stood in the gap to make sure that we have a clean and a healthy environment, air that they can breathe, water that they can drink, communities regardless of whether they are high income or low income, where children are extra exposed to asthma, carcinogens, nitrate levels that flow into the groundwater and contaminate our water system. So I'm extremely proud of the work that you all are doing every single day on behalf of all of us. And I hope that as we sunset and look toward the future of this work, that when we're asked the question, how are the children, we will all be able to answer unapologetically that the children are well.
Thank you and God bless you. Appreciate it.